Hey guys, it's Chili here. Welcome back to Hardware 3D. In the last video, we did some cool stuff, right? Constant buffer, got our matrix transformation going up in the vertex shader, and that's great. But, uh, I mean, doing this manual setting of all the elements in our transformation matrix, we could do this. We have the technology, we have the know-how, but do we wanna? No. We wanna, we want this all automated for us, right? But I don't want to make a whole library for matrix operations and vector operations. I want that, I want someone to do that for me. So in this video, we're going to look at the direct X math library thing, utility, because it is going to make our life a lot easier. Now, as I've already mentioned, direct 3d 11 is mostly focused on the hardware interface, especially after it was incorporated into the Windows SDK. That's when they ditched all the Direct 3D X stuff. Uh, but there are still a few general utilities left, and Direct X Math is one of those. It implements a lot of the algorithms and operations uh, that are needed for matrices and vectors, and that's going to save us a lot of time. We don't have to write, we don't have to debug, we don't have to maintain all that code. And it's got another nice little perk, and that is it supports SIMD optimization, single instruction, multiple data. What does that mean? Well, it means instead of taking one instruction to do a single division, you can do four divisions at the same time with a single instruction. That's four times speed boost. And that ain't bad, right? Now, there's a little trade off for this SIMD stuff. And that means that alignment is a thing. The alignment of your data becomes somewhat of an issue. And DirectX Math sort of takes care of that for you, but there are still a few things that you should be aware of. Maybe I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of this video. So to get started, uh, we want to go into graphics.cpp and we're going to include DirectXMath.h. Beautiful. And there you go. You've got DirectX Math. You have the power. Now, the thing about DirectX Math, it's good. It puts all of its garbage in a namespace, which is playing very nice with us. Uh, the namespace is direct X, and then you've got all this vector matrix bullhork. But the thing about Chili, Chili don't want to type out this stuff every single time, direct X colon colon, and he don't want this long namespace chilling out in his code. But I do like namespaces, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a, myself a little namespace alias. We'll call it DX is equal to direct X. That'll make things a little sexier for me now. What are we going to do? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to replace this 2D float array in our constant buffer with a DirectX math type. So we're going to go DX and the main type, the main types you're working with are the XM types. There are two main ones, XM matrix and XM vector. We're going to do XM matrix. So we're going to call that one again, transform, no need to change that name. And there you go. And that's all you need to do to declare it in your constant buffer. Now we want to initialize that bad boy. Now, what the XM matrix is, basically, it is a 4x4 four four floating point matrix, an array of uh, floats, but you never, ever access its elements directly because it, think of it as a kind of a black box, and the data that's loaded in the XM matrix is loaded in a way that's optimized for SIMD, and you don't ever touch those data members. You only interface with it using the functions from DirectX Math. So, how do we initialize this bad boy? Well, let's get rid of all this garbage here, and let's call some DX functions. So, let's see, it should be XM matrix, and then you're gonna have a whole big ass list of uh, matrix functions here. Most of them are factory functions. They'll give you a rotation matrix around X, around Y, around Z, a scaling matrix. Some of them are operation matrices, like XM matrix multiply performs a matrix multiplication operation on two matrices. So let's get us a rotation around Z. And that is going to be, it's going to need the angle. It takes a float right there. So now we've got our rotation in here. Now we were also scaling the X axis, right? So in order to get those two operations together, we've got to multiply those two matrices together. So we can call DX. XM matrix multiply, and the first matrix is going to be our rotation, and the second matrix is going to be our scaling matrix, and we can go 3 over 4, and the rest of them don't scale them, so we just want to put 1s in the Y and the Z, 
and then there you go. You've got your matrix transformation with rotation and scaling all done up here. And isn't that a lot nicer than what we had before? Let's see if it actually works. And you can see here it's working exactly the same as it was working before. No problems, except it's a hell of a lot easier to write, hell of a lot easier to read, etc, etc. Now one thing you might notice about DirectX Math, it's a very kind of C style API with free functions and you pass its structures like XM Matrix. Uh, but it does also support a little bit of, uh, what do you call it, C++, syntactic sugar. So XM Matrix has an overload of the multiplication operator and you can multiply two matrices with this guy. And uh, it'll work the same as it worked before. So you notice, uh, one thing to notice here is matrices are right multiplied. So the order of operations is this one happens first, then this one happens. Um, doesn't matter for rotation and scaling, but when you mix translation into the mix there, then it starts to make a difference. Uh, so right multiplication and the matrices from DirectX Math are row major. Now I mentioned this in the previous video, but uh, HLSL expects your matrices to be column major and you can tell it that your matrices are row major and it'll work with that but the operations will be a little bit slower so if we want to optimize our shaders and we generally do what we can do is we can say okay we're going to give you column major matrices and then all we got to do is transpose our matrices before we send them over to our shader and the way you can do that is xm matrix transpose and there you go. You do this operation on this matrix here, and that will give you the transposed matrix, and then everything should work fine, except it'll be a little more efficient on the GPU side. And it's generally a very good trade-off. A one-time transpose, which is a very fast operation on the CPU side, to optimize probably thousands of operations on the GPU side. All right, now let's set ourselves a simple little task here. Let's say we want our object to follow the mouse. So, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to need to take in some data in here, extra data, float x and float y. And then we're going to want to add a translation to our transformation here. So translation, and uh, that is going to be, mm, we're going to want x, y, and this one, z is going to be zero. And then we're going to make the header file match. Uh, where is it? There it is. And then we've actually got to pass that information in from uh, app.cpp, I believe. Yeah, draw test triangle here is big mad. So we pass in the mouse position X and the position Y, and nothing can possibly go wrong. Oh, wait, we don't have our object anymore. That's a problem. And well, wait, wait, I saw it for a second. Mm, so something is going on here more than meets the eye. Uh, if you want a little challenge, you want a little bit of a brain teaser, you can try to figure out why this isn't working and fix it. But I'm going to do it right now. So first things first, obviously, the space that we're working in in our rendering is normalized device coordinates and the mouse position is not in normalized device coordinates. So anything above one is probably going to go way off the screen. So we want to scale by the width and the height of our screen, which is we're just going to hard code that in here. 800 and 600 and uh, how do you think that is gonna work make your predictions now it's better but it's still weird right we're moving down our thing is going up uh, it's sort of tracking us in the X but it's only keeping basically to the right half of the screen and to the uh, the top half the top right quadrant is basically our uh, our range of mobility here so What's weird? What's going on here? Well, you know, normalized device coordinates, it goes from negative one to positive one. This is ranging from zero to one. So that's not right. The range here is uh, one unit, whereas the range in normalized device coordinates is two units from the left hand side to the right hand side. So to, to make the range match, we can set this to 400 and 300. And now the range will match, but this range is going to be from zero to two. And we want from negative one to positive one. So if we subtract one here, that will give us a range from negative one to positive one. And we can do the same here. 
make your predictions. Have we solved the problem yet? Well, it's following us in the X, but in the Y, it's going in the opposite direction. And that makes sense when you think about it, because in uh, graphics coordinates, in our mouse coordinates or in pixel coordinates, Y goes down. But in normalized device coordinates, Y goes up. So that's why you're getting that opposite. So we've got to negate. And if we negate this, this one becomes negative, and this one becomes positive. Now if we run it, what do you think? Have we solved it? It does appear that we have indeed solved it, and now it is nicely following our mouse. Beautiful. And that's it. It's pretty much just that easy to work with matrices in DirectX Math. It's going to make our life a lot easier because it has a lot of operations, not just simple transformations like rotation, scaling, but also stuff to, for example, set up your projection matrix. You can look at the DirectX Math programming reference on MSDN, and uh, you can look at, let's see, matrix functions. You can see there's a whole buttload of them in here. You got projection matrices for perspective, orthographic, with field of view, without field of view, right-handed, left-handed, you got look at matrices, you got, you got everything pretty much that you're going to want right in here. And not just these matrix functions, a whole bunch of other stuff, plane functions, conversion, color, quaternion stuff, lots of good stuff in here for you to explore. And of course, as we progress, I will be introducing many of these functions as they are pertinent to what we are doing in the current video. Now, the other main data type in DirectX Math is XM vector. That's going to give you a vector of four floats. And again, you think of it as a black box. It's optimized for SIMD, and uh, you interface with it using the functions in DirectX Math. Now, we tend to prefer processing our vertices, our vectors on the vertex shader, but sometimes you got to do some of this processing on the CPU. And now, uh, when you do have to do it, it's nice to have these various operations like uh, matrix vector multiplication, dot product, cross product, etc. all implemented for you. And if you're doing a bunch of heavy duty vector processing on the CPU, it's nice to have that SSE support enabled for you automatically. Now we could convert our vertex type here to use XM vector, but there's really no benefit for us because we're not doing any kind of vector processing on the CPU side. Uh, but I do just want to show you a quick example of how one uses XM vector. So we can create an XM vector and we want to load it with some values. And the simplest way to set the values of an XM vector is XM vector set. So you can set a vector like this, 3300. And uh, let's just try to dot product that with itself. So auto result is equal to dx XM. And you might look for XM vector dot and say, wait a minute doesn't have dot product? What the hell, Microsoft? You dropped the ball on this one. Well, the thing about dot product is XM vector always has four elements, but depending on the actual data you're storing, you might only want to take the dot product of the first three or the first two. Uh, so you have XM vector four dot, three dot, two dot. Uh, so let's do XM vector four dot, because it's always going to be the same four, three, two, because the last two are zero anyways. And what it's going to take is it is going to take two XM vectors. It, the thing here says FX M vector. That's just a type that's used mainly for uh, the parameters of functions, but it'll accept an XM vector and work fine. So we'll go V, we'll dot it with itself. Now you never, like I said, XM vector is a black box. You never, it, you never really look at its data. You have to extract the data if you want to look at individual elements of it. So we'll do dx get x, seems to be a good one there, and we'll pass it the result, and that will extract the x component, and then we can examine that in the debugger. So let's put this in debug mode, and let's, uh, let's see if we get an expected result here. Now, well, I guess I can't use the same parameter name twice, can I? Let's try this again. So we set our xm vector, we do our dot product, and then we get the we extract the x and store that in xx. And we can see that xx is 18, which is the correct dot product. 3 times 3 plus 3 times 3 is 18. There you go. So, it's not that hard. It's a little awkward, but when you're processing a large amount of data, 
it's very efficient to use XM vectors like this. And let's have one final little example here of uh, transforming an XM vector with an XM matrix. So, the transformation, you have two options. You can transform as a VEC3, interpreting your XM matrix as a 3 by 3 matrix, or VEC4 by 4 by 4 matrix. So you do XM, so do XM vector, let's do 3 by 3, 3, and transform. And then you pass it a vector, V, and you pass it a matrix, and there you go. Nothing could be simpler, and if we scale 3 by 1.5, we should see 4.5 coming out of our X coordinate there. And when we step over this, we do get 4.5. So there you go. A couple of examples of this. We won't be using um, XM vector for a little while, I don't think, but it'll probably come up sometime in the future and you're going to see more of it at that point. So there you have it. A little taste of XM matrix and XM vector. I'm going to be going into more detail on these guys as it makes sense in future videos. But in the meanwhile, if you're interested and you want to do your own research, and I encourage you to do so, a great place to start is the Microsoft Documents. In the DirectX Math Programming Guide, getting started here gives you a lot of information. Uh, now there's one thing, one little warning that I definitely want to bring to your attention if you're going to be doing some of this on your own. So like I said, and it says here in the Getting Started Guide as well, XM Vector and XM Matrix are the workhorses of the DirectX Math Library, uh, and working with them is key to using the library. However, because they're SIMD optimized, they have some restrictions and you have to understand those. Specifically, they have to be aligned on 16-byte boundaries in memory. Uh, and they're annotated, so the compiler is going to automatically do that, but on the heap, um, you're not going to be guaranteed that your heap allocation will be aligned like that. On 64-bit windows, it is guaranteed to be 16-byte aligned, but on 32-bit windows, it's only going to be 8-byte aligned. So you got to be careful, especially when you're embedding these types in your own types and then doing heap allocations. You might have misalignments, and that's going to cause some segment faults. One thing to look into is the, uh, the other types that uh, DirectX Maths supplies. So it mainly works with XM Vector and XM Matrix. But there are also types like XM Float 3, XM Float 4. And these guys don't require the alignment that XM Vector requires. Uh, and they don't take up the space. Like if you have a vector of three elements, if you store it in XM Vector, it's going to take up four floats worth of memory, regardless. But if you don't want to waste your memory, you can use XM Float 3 to store that data. And when it's time to do operations, you load it into an XM Vector, you do all your operations, and when you're done, you store it back into the XM Float 3. So it's very common to use these guys to embed uh, vector and matrix data into your own data types. And then you can use vector loading and vector storage functions to move the data between these types and XM Vector, XM Matrix. So if you're going to do your own experiment, keep the uh, alignment problems in mind, and also be aware that there are other types that you can use uh, to work with XM vector and matrix. But that's going to about do it for today. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. Helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more hardware 3D.